ruling uh, section, the chapter went through a significant update this last time. Um, and the primary stuff that we changed is um, the designations, the numbering method. Um, so the original classes were W1, W2, W3. Off the top of your head, does anybody really know what that means? So we changed it to W17, W27, W32. And basically what this means is if you're talking W27, then the water supply to either the CDU or to the IT equipment um, is a maximum of 27 degrees centigrade. W32 accordingly, you know, maximum 32 degrees centigrade. So it's a little bit more intuitive now um, in terms of the definitions. Um, we also added in a, an additional cooling class, uh, which is W40. And quite frankly, the W40 edition is what prompted this whole thing because we're sitting there going, well, is this W3.5, W3.8? Like, what is this thing called? Um, and so, you know, the, the discussion was the, the water cooling classes are likely to change more over the coming years as technology evolves um, than the air cool classes are. So if we put that temperature designation at the back end of it, not only does it mean a little bit more to somebody intuitively, it becomes a lot easier to add a cooling class in there if we need to or subtract one or change one, so on and so forth. Uh, the W40 class was actually added because a lot of the climate scenarios in the, uh, the EU can go compressorless um, once you hit 40 degrees centigrade in the water. Um, so there are a lot of solutions being designed and, and provided by manufacturers these days um, that were designed around W40, um, but we were jumping straight from 32 degrees centigrade all the way up to 45 degrees centigrade. There's this massive temperature gap in the, the cooling classes. So we added this one in here. The other thing that was kind of interesting as we were going through the conversation is how compliance with a specific cooling class was actually defined. And it wasn't very well defined in the thermal guidelines previously. Um, so we were finding some manufacturers were taking a little bit of liberty with it where if their solution um, touched any temperature within that class. So for example, W27 is up to 27 degrees centigrade. Anything above 27 degrees centigrade is, is not W27 compliant. We were finding scenarios where folks were, or manufacturers were saying, well, our, our inlet design conditions are 28 degrees centigrade. So we're gonna call that W3, the, uh, the old W3, which would have been W32 except you can't run that same solution at 32 degrees centigrade water and actually have it operate properly. So what we did is we clarified that in order to be compliant with a particular cooling class, say W32, for example, that the ITE has to be able to operate fully unthrottled through the entire temperature range of that W class. That actually brings the definition in line with what you have on the air-cooled side. So, you know, air-cooled equipment that is designated for the A2 cooling class can operate unthrottled through that entire temperature uh, range. We didn't have that, that consistency within the w, uh, w class designations, but that is there now. There's also been a, a deliberate attempt to eliminate the, uh, the use of the word water and replace it with liquid not because of the fact that a bunch of people are scared of water, but they don't seem to be scared of liquid, um, but because we're finding more and more scenarios where we have engineered fluids um, that are in these systems as opposed to water. So here's really the, the, the updated uh, table. The primary thing that's really changed in this is again, we've got the temperature designations over here as opposed to W1, 2, 3, et cetera. W40 is a new system, or new, I'm sorry, a new uh, classification that's been added in here. And then the old W5, which is pretty much anything over 45 degrees centigrade, is now called W plus because we don't, there's not really an upper bound on it. Um, an interesting thing in here, just so folks are aware, is the minimum water temperature for all these classes is two degrees centigrade. Um, when you're doing design for this, um, you gotta be really careful because while the ITE systems can technically operate that cold, if you have a failure in your controls or whatever, um, you gotta be worried about or, or thinking about condensation on your piping. This type of scenario that we, we see here is not really a continuous operating scenario. 
it's actually one where the system has maybe been offline for major maintenance, repair, uh, installation, et cetera, and you're doing a cold startup on your system um, and you don't already have that heat in the cooling room. So again, uh, we, you know, we, we uh, clarified compliance with cooling classes. Um, we also have added a lot of information on immersion and hybrid tech, uh, cooling technologies, uh, liquid cooling technologies. Um, we're, we're seeing more scenarios where, uh, you know, immersion is not necessarily um, in a, a bath in a tank laying on its side. Um, we're starting to see vertical immersion where um, you have chassis that are liquid tight and they're in a vertically stacked rack. And, and so you're flooding the, uh, the, the chassis but in a vertical rack configuration. We also added a lot of discussion on dew point control um, and understanding the condensation challenges or condensation risks that you have, uh, particularly during cold startup of the system um, and how insulation and ambient dew point control within your, your data center may, uh, may impact that. We've also added um, a, a warning in, in there regarding the, the future TDP um, increase. The reason we did that is that as more and more folks are, are moving to liquid cooling, um, more uh, markets, more workloads are moving to liquid cooling, a lot of the discussion and the focus, depending on where you are in the world, is let's run these fluid systems as hot as we can, maximize energy uh, recovery, heat reuse, district heating, all these great things that we can do off of the high temp fluid. And that is absolutely applicable. Um, it's done in a lot of places. There's a lot of validity to it. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for it. However, um, right now, the forecasted TDP increase on the highest performing processors, whether you're talking CPUs, GPUs, ASICs, chips, whatever it happens to be, these TDPs are, are, uh, are going up at an extremely high rate. And the thermal engineers from the chip manufacturers that are involved in this committee, and this is one of the great parts about the thermal guidelines coming directly from these thermal engineers, is they're basically saying, you know, if you're talking an HPC workload or a heavy scientific workload, the days of being able to operate these um, liquid cooled systems at 75, 80, 85 degrees centigrade are numbered for these workloads. Um, in order to, to cool the chips, you're gonna start seeing on these really high density applications where you're talking, you know, 150 kW a, a rack or 150 kW a tank and up, um, you're gonna start seeing a need to lower that inlet fluid temperature um, to those systems. And the main reason that that's a big warning is, is we go back up here to these, these W classes and we talk about the primary uh, facilities that are used to cool them. Um, we've, you've got to be very careful if you're up in this area, um, and if you're going to be housing HPC equipment and you're all, um, compressorless cooling right now, that may work for a little while. Um, it may change in the future. Um, we're, we're seeing that trend, uh, coming from the ITE manufacturers that those temperatures are going to start going back down. Um, and you may have some HPC facilities that have to start actually adding uh, compressorized cooling or maybe evaporative cooling in place of pure dry cooling um, in order to get those, those cooling temperatures back down.